Hey YouTube, Esberg Ranch here. Um, I've gotten a, a couple of requests for additional information and, and really the follow-on video that I wanted to do about uh, my kiln controller. Um, there's one video out there right now and I'll figure out how to put a link in here somewhere uh, regarding the expected components that I was going to use. And in fact, that's exactly what I used. And what's right here now is the kiln controller the way I used it in the last revision. Um, I put everything in a nice box, got a display so if you walk right up to it you can see uh, what's going on, temperatures, etc. Um, I've got a programming port and 12 volts and then across the back I've got uh, DIN plugs for the various different temperature sensors and, and power relays for turning things on and off. Um, the relays uh, I explained in the other video and I'll show you in a minute and the uh, temperature sensor for the boards, um, the middle of the kiln, the end of the kiln, and then outside ambient temperature, because I record all of those, uh, are, are all here. And I'll try and dig up uh, the information on exactly what the components were and I'll put them in the comments below. So this is, this is how I boxed it up and I'll open this in a second. This, uh, this old Milwaukee box, I repurposed to put all the sensors in. The kiln is, call it portable. Um, I can pick it up with the forks on my tractor and move it. It's currently in the other barn uh, waiting for its next use. So I took this and I cut the guts out of it. And this is where I put all the components. So in my first video, I talked about a fan at each end blowing opposite directions to sort of make a, a circle. Um, I decided I wanted more air, so I've added three more fans, and these sit along the front bottom of the loading door, one after the other, and if this cable was unwrapped, there's plenty of cable here, um, blowing in a circle around the length of them. Uh, I don't have any pictures of it, but that's what these are. These here are, uh, these are 24 volt fans, and I have a 24 volt power supply that uh, gets plugged in directly. I don't, uh, these are just an always on kind of thing. This cable here is one of my temperature sensors. Uh, this is the cable that runs around to the Dallas one wire sensors. Again, DIN plug here. And then I've got additional ones for, uh, this is one of the temperature sensors here. Uh, this is another one. I believe this is the ambient one or maybe the middle because it's real short. This one here, these are the, the uh, sensors that I push into the boards. They're in a stainless steel tube. And that gives me a better idea of the internal temperature of the boards. I have two. Uh, you can either put them real high in the stack or low in the stack whatever you want to know, or uh, if you're running um, different thickness boards through the kiln, you might put one in the thinner boards and one in the thicker boards. So that's what these are. And then this one, these are wired a little different. They've got a little header on them, and this is in my video too. Um, this one here is one of the middle sensors, and this sensor here has temperature and humidity both. Um, and you can see I've got it labeled. I've got them all labeled. So these are the three power switches, or the power tails, power switch tail twos. Um, these are the relays that uh, go in and get plugged into the relay port. So one of those cables, oh, that's what the pink one is. The pink cable here runs to the relays and is what's plugged into the relay port. Um, it's got a different number of pins than these others, so you can't confuse it. And then the last, next to the last item in the box is this one. This is the 24 volt power supply, and that's what's driving the three extra fans. The other two fans are 12 volt, and they're run in a different manner. This, uh, this affair right here is how I was powering the box. Um, what you don't see here is a 12 volt power supply. The other two fans are 12 volts. Um, and the controller itself, uh, although the components in it are all 5 volts, uh, it's got a 12 volt uh, voltage regulator in it. 
I run a converted XT power supply for my 12 volts, and that's what this is. It's got banana plugs on it, and then this plugs in over here where it says 12 volts. So those are all the cables. Nothing different here from what the first video was. Um, I've prettied some stuff up. I've put DIN connectors on things. Um, but other than the three extra fans, there's really nothing new here that uh, we didn't talk about before. So let me put these all back in the box and I'll open the controller up and you can see how I built it on the inside. So this little box came from an electronics surplus store here in the Dayton area. Uh, the components inside are not this big, but the reality is I wanted something big enough. I didn't want this little tiny thing sitting on top of the kiln. I wanted something big enough that, you know, if I was fumbling around, I was less likely to knock it off. I thought about putting weight in it because it's fairly light. Um, that's a manufacturing trick to make you think that things are, are stronger and more sturdy if they weigh more. Um, I didn't do that. All right, so there's the inside. Nothing real fancy. About the only thing in here that you might not have expected was this right here. That's a Bluetooth transmitter. Um, I leave this out in another section of this barn and then I can monitor the output of this via Bluetooth. Um, the simplest way to do it, uh, I can do it with my cell phone. I downloaded a, a Bluetooth console app. It just makes a Bluetooth connection. And then the controller streams serial across that. It comes out in completely unformatted fashion. Format it any way I want. The other thing I do is I will connect to it with my laptop and then I log that data. Um, I've also gone so far as to start experimenting in this last run with uh, not only logging the data but putting the data out across the web um, using a web-based a, a web -based service or a cloud-based service to then push the data to me so I can be anywhere in the world. Uh, I was running a custom app receiving what the status of my kiln was. So this is underneath here. There's actually a, uh, an Arduino Mega uh, Rev2 here and then on top of it is a uh, an expansion board plugged into the top which is just a sensor board. Now I will tell you that these both came off of eBay they both probably came out of China, if not directly. But I had already built this with a brand name Arduino, which Rev, uh, Arduino Mega Rev3 2560. Um, but they're kind of pricey, and I didn't want to commit it to this box for the sole purpose. Um, you can buy no-name Chinese versions. Uh, people have had varying luck. I had fine. Mine saw good luck with me. Um, and I chose to commit that because it was only, I don't know, like 30 bucks. So I was much better off than that, with that. Um, and then again, the sensor board is really just about convenience. It brought out lots of grounds, uh, ground, uh, ground pins, um, gave me all my I.O. in a real convenient package, and I was set to go. And then in the front, this is actually a spark fun. Uh, this is a three-line LCD and I believe I have the model number for that. Um, I'll try and put that in the comments. So it's just got some spacers on it to back it off. The LED here on the side is just a power indicator saying, hey, I'm on, and it blinks when it transmits. So if I'm standing where I can see this and I see it blink, I should expect an update on my remote, whatever my remote client happens to be. So that's really it, nothing overly fancy from a hardware standpoint because, well, I'm not a fancy hardware kind of guy. You see a couple of resistors on here. Uh, those resistors are per the data sheet for some of the temp sensors, so that's why they're there. They're in here instead of on the cables. 
I chose this board because cereal's easy and I like easy. So not only is the Bluetooth cereal, the uh, display is cereal, um, as well as I wanted to be able to program it at the same time. So that takes the three serial ports or the three UARTs that is what drew me to the uh, 2560 Rev 3. And if that was, if it's not a 2560, I'm going to be correcting myself on the screen all over the place. So there it is, um, software functionality. Let's talk a minute about software functionality. What does it do? Um, the software I've written for it so far uh, does several things and it's evolved over time. Um, one of the things it does is when you first start the kiln, if the inside of the kiln is below a set temperature, temperature that you can configure, it will not turn on the dehumidifier. It'll turn on the heaters first and it will bring it up to a temperature. In my case, every time I seem to run this kiln, it's winter time. And when I get it all closed up and ready to go, the inside of the kiln's 50 degrees. If you start and try and run a household dehumidifier at 50 degrees, it will freeze up before it does any good. So I bring the inside of the kiln temperature up to about 75 degrees, 80 degrees. Then I start the dehumidifier. And once the dehumidifier is running, the heat generated from it alone is enough and I can turn the heater off. That mode or that stage is built into this now. So if I set it to auto, First thing it checks is am I below the minimum temperature for the dehumidifier? If it is, start the heater and wait. Once the dehumidifier is running, it will maintain temperature using the dehumidifier on and off. I learned from the very first running that the dehumidifier does not need to run constantly. And in fact, you can get yourself in overheat situations as well as just needlessly consuming more power than necessary. So you can set your dehumidifying temperature on it. It will use the dehumidifier and cycle it off and on to maintain whatever temperature you wish. And there's a range. Um, I have a five degree spread in it now. I, that relieves me of any concern about it trying to cycle the dehumidifier too fast and, and uh, screwing it up. So no worries there. It will also use the heater to maintain a minimum temperature. So even once the dehumidifier is on, if the dehumidifier cannot maintain a minimum temperature, it will use the heater to augment it and keep it up. Where that becomes important is if it drops to 15 below one night and your dehumidifier, your dehumidifier can't keep up, it's not generating enough heat. Um, I had that happen one night. It didn't get cold enough to cause a problem, but it was just a nice fail safe for me so that was logic I added. Um, because of the space in the kiln, when I'm done drying the wood and I and say I want to do, I want to set pitch and I need to bring it up higher, I have to open the end of the kiln, take the dehumidifier out and add a second heater. The small heater I use doesn't have enough watts to bring the temperature up to set pitch. Um, setting pitch in pine, varying answers there, Basically, the hotter it is, the, the shorter the duration of time with some minimum temperatures. Oh, I've read anywhere from 150 to 180. Um, I was driving 175 inside the kiln without any problem with two little heaters. Um, I was well within all my uh, amperage limitations of my cords and my plugs and things like that. Yes, it was in a confined space. Do this at your own risk. Blah, blah, attorney, attorney, attorney. So those are the things that, uh, that this will do. Um, if all you're doing is drying a hardwood and you don't have to set pitch, this thing's freaking great. Um, the ability to hold a temperature is, is priceless. I couldn't necessarily do that the first time I ran and it took a lot of needless power. And in a warmer climate, without being able to cycle a dehumidifier, you would actually overheat the kiln. Um, you don't want to get it too hot when you're drying. So that was how I ran it. Uh, this is my setup um, and 
as soon as I come up with some more logs or some more boards, uh, I will be ready to go again. I'm all kitted up. So, like I said, I'll try and put some details down in the comments. If you have any questions, well, shoot them down in the comments. I'll try and get back to you. Thanks for watching.